Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the New York City Bar Association. I'm Steve Cass. I'm the chair of our task force on the rule of law. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth session of our forum on the international rule of law. Earlier sections have dealt with uh, threats to the rule of law through autocratic regimes, threats to the rule of law posed in China, and the importance of reforming international institutions to uh, develop and enforce the rule of law. Tonight, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have as our principal speaker, David Milliband, who is the president of the International Rescue Committee and a distinguished panel of commentators and speakers who will uh, have a chance to speak with you after David's comments. Um, this evening's session will be moderated by Michael Cooper. Michael Cooper is a, the former chair of our Council on International Affairs uh, and of our United Nations Committee. He is an as associate vice president of Oxford University in North America, and he is a person who has labored in the field of refugee rights for IRC, for H Human Rights Watch, and for other equally or almost equally distinguished institutions. Um, uh, I want to thank, uh, before turning it over to Michael, who will explain the ground rules of this evening's session, uh, the other committees that have sponsored and co-sponsored this session. The principal sponsor is the Council of Interna on International Affairs of the Association, and co-sponsoring association committees can uh, include, in addition to the Task Force on Human Rights, our committees on the United Nations, international law, international environmental law, European affairs, international human rights, and immigration and nationality law. We are also fortunate to have, as co-sponsoring organizations, the University of Oxford, its North American office, the Migration Policy <coughs> Institute, Human Rights First, and the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility, along with the International Rescue Committee. I would also like to thank um, Robert Cusimano and his uh, uh, distinguished foundation for hosting the reception that we will be having uh, following tonight's presentation. So thank you very, very much. We appreciate your being here. And I just want to mention that tonight's session will be in accordance with all of the association's ground rules, which means that all of the statements you'll be hearing this evening uh, are on the record and should be taken to heart. With that in mind, let me turn it over to Michael Cooper, who will uh, uh, present our speakers and conduct our initial discussion and interview with Mr. Milliman. Thank you all very, very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to start out by introducing our featured guest this evening and tell you a little bit about David Miliband's rather extraordinary background. David is the president and the CEO of an organization called the International Rescue Committee, one of the world's uh, leading providers of humanitarian relief. So David oversees all of IRC's humanitarian relief efforts in about 40 war-affected countries around the world, but IRC also resettles refugees here in the United States in about 20 different cities. Um, during his esteemed tenure at IRC, David has really expanded uh, the work of the IRC, and I want him to talk a little bit more about that later. He served for a while as the 74th Secretary of Foreign Affairs for the United Kingdom, um, advancing their human rights and uh, representing the UK throughout the world. He also served for some time as the Secretary of State for the Environment and uh, led the way and pioneered in, in um, fashioning the world's first legally binding emissions reduction requirements. He was a member of parliament for some time. He went to the University of Oxford. I represent Oxford here in the US and he uh, studied PPE. It's a, a famous degree in philosophy, politics and economics, first class honors, also a, a master's degree from MIT. His book, his first book is fantastic. It's called Rescue, Refugees and in the Political Crisis of Our Time. David's parents were refugees. They fled Europe for Britain um, during World War II. Britain is Europe, after that. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, he lives here in the city with his wife and two sons. Um, 
President Clinton once called David one of the ablest, most creative public servants of our time, and I couldn't agree more. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. It's very nice to be here. I thought that when you introduced and you said that everything conformed to the rules of the Bar Association, that everything would be true, but you just said everything would be on the record, so I stand yeah. corrected. Uh, <laughs> Well, the truth is what we'll be debating here this okay. evening, I suppose. Um, when I moved to New York many years ago as a young man, one of the first friends I made said to me, you know, Michael, even if you're one in a million, there are at least eight other people exactly like you here in the city. And I remember looking in the phone book, and sure enough, there were dozens of Michael Coopers. One of them actually um, worked here or represented here at the Bar Association. Michael A. Cooper was the president of this association for some time. Some years ago, there was an email chain that went back and forth, and Michael D. Cooper and Michael A. Cooper were somehow conflated. And on this email chain, Michael A. Cooper had made the recommendation that we should have a gentleman named David Miliband come and speak to us. I got involved in this, and I said, well, I'm, I, 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 um, I've met David a couple times, and I used to work at the International Rescue Committee, and I would love to help um, bring David here if we could. I was looking back at that email chain, and I realized it was 2016-2017. Wow. So it was a long time ago, but I'm wondering, though, David, is it not fortuitous that we have you with us at this moment in time because of what's happening in Ukraine? Is this uh, an historic inflection point for us? I think of the outpouring of support that we've seen from Ukrainians, from governments, from private citizens, from businesses, and I'm wondering if we aren't living through... Um, a unique moment, both from a kind of a geopolitical perspective, but also is it a turning point for our relationship with refuge and with asylum? So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts kind of geopolitically, but also with respect to um, the issues at hand. Well, that's a very interesting way, place to start, because a year ago, we could have said that we were meeting at a time when record numbers of people were fleeing from war and persecution, 35 million refugees and asylum seekers, more or less, in the 2021 UN statistics, 45 million internally displaced. So Syria has 6 million refugees who fled the country, 8 million internally displaced, 4.5 million people internally displaced in Ethiopia, 50,000 only have gone across the border into Sudan uh, recently, or, or, or last year in advance of those uh, statistics. So that would have been one, I don't know about fortuitous, but right. appropriate yeah. uh, moment. Then the Afghan crisis supercharged itself last summer, and 70,000 Afghans were airlifted to the United States, and the International Rescue Committee deployed to eight military bases around the country to register those 70,000 people, and that would have provided, that did provide a moment when people like me argued it was a moment to reset understandings about refugees and refuge. I don't know if you were using that distinction in, in the... Um, in, in the way that as we, people often say refugees are unpopular, but refuge is not unpopular. But um, that Afghan exodus was and is a moment to redefine, reset at least American attitudes towards refugees. But then this Ukraine crisis doubled down on the lessons of, of Afghanistan in various ways. And the figures are remarkable. Six million Ukrainians have crossed the border into Europe, Europe, the European Union, actually, uh, over the last three months. Um, it looks like one and a half or two million may have gone back. Mm -hmm. We can come back to that question because the global figure is that less than 1% of the world's refugees go home in any one year. Uh, now, I think that these three things, the record number of people who are fleeing from war and persecution as refugees and internally displaced, the Afghan crisis, the Ukraine crisis, provide two good reasons to think that it's a moment for a reset, but I don't want to be the one who predicts it will happen because the forces of reaction are quite strong. But why would it be a moment of reset? One, uh, if I'd been here a year ago and said 35 million refugees and asylum seekers, 45 million internally displaced, someone would have said, didn't Stalin say that one person's death is a tragedy, but a million people's death is a statistic? So isn't there a problem with the fact that 80 million displaced sounds like too many? And I would have said, yes, there's a dehumanization that comes with that number. Now, 
the Ukraine crisis, the Afghan crisis provides a moment of rehumanization mm. because the stories have been told so uh, powerfully. The second reason that I think that we could do a reset is that after people say, well, 80 million people or 35 million refugees and asylum seekers, that's dehumanizing because the, the number is so large, doesn't it also show it's impossible to manage? I mean, who can manage 35 million <coughs> refugees and asylum seekers? Um, a lot of people say that. And then I would point to the Ukraine crisis where these 6 million arrivals into Europe have been pretty well handled. Mm. European society has not been overwhelmed by this exodus. I don't like to use the word flood. I think that's a very mm. unfortunate... Um, I wouldn't use that word in this context. But 6 million people have been welcomed into Europe in a reasonably accommodating way. There's been decisive political leadership. First weekend of the Ukraine crisis, the European Council met and agreed that every refugee um, would have three years residence, three years work permit, three years access to social services, three years education for kids, three years welfare benefits. And I, I, was, I stood corrected. There, there were some problems at the border with non-Ukrainians coming across on the Ukrainian side of the border, and we can come back to that. But you don't have to be a Ukrainian to avail yourself of the three years of temporary protected status that the European Union has offered. My country, the UK, has sadly been a laggard in this, and there's only, only 40,000 refugees have arrived, and they've not been given the same kind of rights. But those are good reasons to believe that this humanized moment and this managed moment are good points of, uh, for a reset. However, um, I, I think it would be naive not to recognize that these are white refugees who are coming from, in the main, from uh, Ukraine into, um, into Europe. Many of them are Christian or Orthodox. And the fear-mongering that associate, that's associated with refugees of different color, different religion, hasn't been um, a feature here. And so we take it as our task at the International Rescue Committee to say that the rights, the, the humanization, the management, and the rights that have been accorded to Ukrainian refugees should set a new standard for refugees who are Rohingya from Myanmar or South Sudanese fleeing into um, Uganda. Actually, they, it does give them quite a lot of rights. Uh, Uganda is quite a positive example for the treatment of refugees. But globally, these 35 million refugees and asylum seekers are not well uh, received, including in the United States. So we may want to come to that in respect of asylum seekers at the southern border where, I mean, I hesitate to use this word in this august company because there's 60 lawyers here and they'll tell me I, I, I don't know anything about the law, which is more or less true. But the, um, the rights to claim asylum, which is an international legal right, is not being yes. upheld uh, at the southern border, sorry, at the southern border at the moment. So that's a rather long answer to, a, to, to, to an interesting question, but I think it is a moment certainly to argue for a reset, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a moment to work to extend legal rights to those who, haven't be, who aren't being afforded them properly at the moment. We're expanding our legal services. We'll come back to this at the southern, in the southern states at the moment to try to make sure that those who do arrive are able to enforce their rights in the, in the U.S. legal system. Um, but I, I don't want to underestimate the counter forces. And of course, the Ukrainian example, I and mean, I was in Ukraine two weeks ago, uh, they want to go home as soon as possible. Mm. And while Syrians will tell you in Jordan that they want to go home too, they don't expect to go home, whereas Ukrainians still expect to go home. That's really helpful. You know, I, I, one thing that really stood out for me, and forgive me for going in this direction, but your reluctance to use the word flood. I've often found that when we talk about refugees, we talk about trickles and floods and deluges and, and streams of refugees, and there are all these water metaphors that we use. And I, I wonder if that's the best way to talk about it. Does it feed into this kind of dehumanization of... Well, no one wants to be flooded. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that is what... I'm allergic to the word flood for a rather personal uh, reason. Um, I won't go into this, but there's a moral to this story, which is quite piquant. Um, in 1940, my father and my grandfather fled Belgium and came to the UK. Uh, to cut a long story short, my dad did a year at the LSE, went into the Navy, survived the war. His dad went back to Belgium in 1945, 
My dad's teacher at the LSE was a man called Harold Lasky, who may, some of you may know was a great political scientist. Harold Lasky was then chairman of the Labour Party. The Labour Party was in government. Uh, Harold Lasky wrote to his friend Tutor Ede, who was the Home Secretary in the 1945 government, and said, I've got this bright young student Miliband here. He's uh, going to stay in Britain. He's been in the Navy. Can you arrange for his father and mother and sister who survived the war in Belgium? My, his, my dad's mother and my dad's sister were protected by a Catholic family south of, um, south of Brussels for three years. Um, can you let this fellow in? And Tutor Reed replied and said, well, I'll, I'll look into it. And then eventually replied saying, look, I'm terribly sorry, they don't meet the criteria and we can't have a flood of people coming into uh, the UK. So that's why I'm allergic to the word uh, flood. But there is a, something very piquant about this story, which is that Tutor Ede, who in various ways was a perfectly decent chap, he was the Labour MP for South Shields. And 60 years later, 50 years later, I became the Labour MP you for South MP, Shields. Yeah. So <laughs> there's an interesting moral to that to that story. Indeed. <laughs> Pretty no, extraordinary. That's great. Well, it is extraordinary. And, and it's three, also... there was, Tudor Reid was the Labour MP until 64. And there was Labour MP 64 to 79. There was Labour MP 79 to 2001. And I became the Labour MP for South. So, so only three MPs later, the grandson of the refugee who was rejected entry rejected. by Tudor Reid became the Labour MP for the same constituency that Tudor Reid represented. That's brilliant. That's so, brilliant. That is a pretty amazing story. Look, I, I'd like to hear a bit more um, history. I'm going to toss you a softball. I would just like you to step back a moment and tell us about IRC. But in particular, I'm really interested, David, to hear. I remember reading, uh, what's it called, Mass Exodus, the history of IRC back in the day. So if you could tell us just a little bit about the roots of IRC oh, sure, I've read that in first. European conflict. I'll send you my copy. Uh, yeah. um, Varian Fry and Albert But very Einstein. briefly... Then, briefly that, and then tell us where you are the, today. The International Rescue Committee is a great New York institution. Yes. And the fact that you are all members of the New York Bar Association, and some of you have not heard of the International Rescue Committee, is a tragedy. It's a rather typical of New York that there are great institutions, but they sit side by side. They don't talk to each other. So that's one reason I was keen to do this event. Um, it's a great New York institution because it embodies, in its origins, something important about New York, which is that... The International Rescue Committee was founded by Albert Einstein in the 1930s because Albert Einstein was in New York because he was a refugee from the Nazis and refugees came to New York. And so that's the first reason that it's important. Secondly, New York is quite an impatient place. And Albert Einstein was quite an impatient fellow. And throughout the 1930s, he was rightly impatient. He wrote letters to Eleanor Roosevelt saying, you've got to get your husband to let my Jewish friends come out of Germany because they're going to be slaughtered if you're not careful. And to cut a long story short, he failed to persuade Eleanor Roosevelt, well, Eleanor Roosevelt failed to persuade her husband yeah. to let European Jews come to America or anything like the numbers they deserved to or needed to. And so in his frustration, Albert Einstein rallied 50 friends, there were 51 of them in the end, to form the International Rescue Committee. It was called the Emergency Rescue Committee at the time, it merged with another organization. And our first employee was a man called Varian Fry, who was a New York Times journalist. He set up a safe house in Marseille. In 19, there's a film about him. Some of you may have seen the film in 2006 starring John, uh, William Hurt. Uh, I think it was Varian Fry. Um, I wasn't available at the time to uh, play the role. And uh, <laughs> um, he set up a safe house in Marseille yeah. uh, called Airbell, which issued 2,000 fake passports to a range of Jews, intellectuals, persecuted minorities, including Marx Chagall was saved, oh. saved from the Nazis by... So the organization's got this extraordinary heritage. When I did my job interview eight years ago, I said, you're standing on Einstein's shoulders, but you never tell anyone that you were yeah. founded by Albert Einstein. I don't know how many people, I won't, do a, I won't call out how many people knew that he was founded by Albert Einstein. But we, tr we honor that heritage by being um, a re the largest refugee resettlement agency in 25 years. The cities, we survived the Trump years in, in closing only three uh, offices. We've now expanded two new ones in Louisville, Kentucky, and in um, where, where have we sat? Um, in somewhere in Washington State. I've forgotten the, the, the new one we've uh, opened. Um, and that's an important part of the heritage. But we've become this large international humanitarian aid organization. Eight years ago, we were a $430 million organization. Today, we're a $1.3 billion organization. 
in, uh, with about 20,000 employees in 200 field sites in 35 countries. And what's important to me is that we have a very clear view of what we're there to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're there to help people whose lives are shattered by conflict, persecution or disaster, survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. Gain control of their futures, we say, which is rather more poetic. And when I arrived, we were for refugees and others, and our programs were meant to be life-changing and life-saving, but that didn't tell you who you served, where you worked, or what counted as success. And so we've really drilled into the idea that we're there to help people whose lives are shattered by conflict, persecution, or disaster, that um, we're there to help them survive, recover, and gain control of their lives, and we can measure that in different programs that we run. You can see that on our, on our website. And I think that's been part of the reason why we've grown. We've also grown because there's more disasters and more conflict. Yeah. 55 civil conflicts now plus the Ukraine uh, invasion, so an interstate conflict, 55 intrastate conflicts, and now the interstate conflict between uh, well, the invasion of uh, Ukraine by, uh, by Russia. So the organization has a, uh, the entrepreneurialism, the origins, the impatience of New York, um, but it also has some of the values of New York that drew Einstein here in the first place. Fantastic, fantastic. You know, I was thinking about a conversation you and I had just briefly a couple of years ago about blockchain, and I was remembering back to my time in Albania, in Kosovo, when I was working for the International Rescue Committee. It was before your tenure. And I remember in Albania, when the Kosovars were flooding out, um, IRC was helping them. We had some host family programs. We literally had some folks in some warehouses. We don't like to warehouse refugees, but that was... That was what we had going at the time. And um, I remember going out with some colleagues to meet some refugees, and we wanted to know what they needed. Did they need water or blankets or food or whatever? And what they said to us that they needed was television sets because they needed information. They didn't have um, access to information. Their relatives were back in Kosovo fighting this terrible war, and they wanted to know what was happening. And so I'm thinking back about that 20 or so years ago, and I'm wondering, with the lived experience of refugees today, how has technology, like blockchain, like iPhones, like Zoom, like Venmo payment systems, and all, how, how has it changed the lived experience of, of refugees? Well, I think that the, the short answer to that is that for most refugees, I think, not enough. Yeah. is the answer. Not enough. I mean, the humanitarian sector has not been transformed by the digital revolution yet. And for most of our clients, most of our clients are not middle class. Yeah. Now, the Ukrainians are middle class refugees, relatively speaking. Syrians are relative uh, are middle class. Rel annual average income in um, Ukraine, I think, was $9,000 a head before the war. In Syria, it was 11000 dollars ahead 10 years ago. So they're relatively speaking middle class. Um, in the, from the Central African Republic is $300 ahead for um, Afghanistan is even less, um, $250 ahead. Um, from the Rohingya, from Myanmar, pitifully uh, low. Um, so it's really a split screen. For the, uh, for the more middle class refugees, and certainly for the Ukrainians and for the Syrians, the phone was their TV. And the phone was the way that they kept in touch with what's going on at home. When I was in uh, Moldova last week, or the, two weeks ago, uh, I was talking to six women in a basement of a church, and the woman said, I can't talk to you now. I'm on the phone to my son who's fighting in Odessa. So that connection is uh, much, much stronger because of the digital revolution. Um, I think... We as a sector don't use new technology very much for most of the programs that we deliver. And I don't say that with pride. Um, one interesting example is that we do have an absolutely pioneering information program called Signpost, hmm. which we developed in Greece in 2016. Because what did uh, Syrian refugees do when they got off the boat in Greece? Well, they got out their mobile phone and it was all Greek, so they couldn't understand it, obviously. Um, so we set up Signpost. A million refugees used Signpost in the first six months or something. It was extraordinary. We've expanded it to Jordan. It's a, it's a way not just for us to give information to refugees. It's a way for refugees to talk to each other. 
And in the, South, in the Latin American case, it's a way for refugees to support each other. So if you're a woman on the run in El Salvador, you can go via Facebook to signpost and say, I'm in this town, I've got my son, I'm running away from a gang or from my husband. Uh, where is there a safe house? And someone can tell you, which is pretty brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, it's brilliant. And we're, trying, we're doing that with an organization called United for Ukraine. I was talking to them in Berlin two weeks ago. We're trying to develop that. Um, so there's some information provision. Some of our education programs are using, um, are using there's a lot of bad history of education and technology. Um, I can't remember who it was. Some MIT professor said, if you just give every kid a laptop, it, uh, they'll, they'll teach themselves. But it doesn't work like that. But we found ways, actually, in Bangladesh to really develop education technology well. You, you, you don't eliminate the people, but you use them in different ways. And the final area where I think um, we've been enabled by, by technology is, is obviously in, I mean, we, we, we flipped to remote working pretty effectively during COVID, but more important, I think that for measurement and evaluation, which is quite a big thing for us, uh, it's been facilitated by the digital revolution. Not enough. We've still got a lot, far too many Excel spreadsheets, but better to have an Excel spreadsheet than to have a, uh, a piece of paper. Yeah. Or, you know, just only a piece of paper. So I think it's a good question, and it's, but it, you see, the, the humanitarian sector is, everyone says, well, you, you, we want to put your money into programs, and I keep saying, but if you don't put your money into the back office, you're not going to hire the right people, you're not going to support your workers properly, uh, but, you know, you, people love it when you say, oh, well, 90, 92% of, our, of, your, of your money goes to programs, actually, it's 87% for us, and I'll, de I'll defend that 87%, because 4% goes into fundraising, and 1% goes into security and compliance, and uh, et cetera, so... We've actually gone from spending half a percent of $400 million, so $20 million, mm -hmm. on IT, to 3% of $1.3 billion. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're motoring. Yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. But it sounds like if you had a bit more money, you could do more, right? Definitely. Okay, that's what I thought. As long as it's unrestricted. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to ask you, just, just to close out on that, I mean, I imagine also that technology is very useful in assessments and things like that. But I was also thinking back about Kosovo with the, um, lots of stories back then about refugees escaping with the hard drives from their computers. And somehow that was also humanizing at, at the moment. Um, and I suppose in this day and age, you know, the connection with technology and seeing refugees with iPads and things like that probably also helps us connect in a way when they're middle class, as you say. But, um, but let me ask you another question, David. So Ukraine is big in the news right now, and it has become a kind of an inflection point. But if you could name one other refugee crisis in the world right now that we should be paying attention to and we're not paying attention to. I'm well, I think you've got, you have to look at the largest one. I mean, yeah. it's the Syria crisis is 10 years old, and it's, it, everyone's forgotten about it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to Jordan and Lebanon, actually. They've been hosting 650,000 refugees in the case of Jordan. I'm at 1.2, 1.4 million in the case of Lebanon. Um, Jordan's done well on health um, for refugees. Um, Lebanon, not so, not so good, but then their own situation is so difficult. Most people think refugees are in rich countries, or the media reports that refugees are in rich countries. 85% of the world's refugees are in poor countries. People talk about, I had some, a very distinguished person come to me today, and he kept on saying, but, you know, we can do something for your refugees in camps. And I kept on saying to him, most refugees are not in camps. 60% of refugees are in urban areas. He was sort of having trouble getting the point. Um, but they're not in camps, and most refugees don't go home. Uh, and that's why this integration, I mean, Alex Olenikov is going to be on the panel. He knows, you know, tons about this. Um, we pretend that the solutions are going home going to a third country or um, integrating in the local community, but none of them are really available. Yeah. You know, very unlikely to go home. Refugee resettlement to third countries is pretty, pretty limited. Even the U.S. In, its, in the best days only let in nine. Ronald Reagan let in more refugees than any other American president. So if anyone tells you it's very left-wing to let in refugees, then remind them that Ronald Reagan was not a Bolshevik. And um, the... Uh, the, the integration into the local communities is rarely done as well as the Germans do it or the Ugandans do it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you step back for a moment from refugees and asylum seekers and looked at 
human mobility more broadly to include economic migrants and people displaced by disaster and so-called climate change refugees. We don't really like to use that phrase, but, but sort of human mobility writ large. And I know it's not, it's not directly where IRC is going, but what do you see happening in the decades ahead? Well, there's going to be more of it. There's going to be more people. I mean, I'm an immigrant. So I'm actually a temporary immigrant, and I, I, I'm still a UK citizen, but I'm on a visa. Um, but, I, but you're going to have more people migrating for economic reasons because global inequality looks like it's growing. Uh, or inequality within states is growing while global inequality is actually narrowing, just to be yeah. uh, accurate about it. Um, so there's going to be more economic, more people choosing to move and I think there's going to be more people forced to move because I don't see the diplomacy or the um, state building or the political institution building that will help people forge compromise in their own political systems. And you see a rise of quite ugly forms of nationalism. I mean, Isaiah Berlin wrote about two concepts of nationalism, and there was one of them was aggressive and one of them was patriotic, really. And that's, a, I think, a better mm. distinction. Patriotism feels it can be positive sum nationalism is, is zero sum uh, and there's quite ugly nationalism in and ethnocentrism in quite large countries mm -hmm. so um, I think and then you've got the client I don't like climate refugees but like you but climate induced movement and climate IDPs internally displaced right. feels like a you know Bangladeshis forced north are not going to go they're going to go to other parts of Bangladesh they're not going to go into India so I think um, this, is a, this is a coming issue, and it's still a manageable issue because you've got 80 million people and the global population is 8 billion. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Europe's got 8, 6 million refugees, but it's a continent of 600 million people. It's not manageable if only poor countries take refugees, and it's not manageable if they're not fairly shared out, and it's not manageable if refugee hosting is not seen as the delivery of a global public good. I'm sorry to introduce a bit of economics into a, a law venue, but um, I think it is a global public good to host refugees, and the benefits are not confined to those who do it. We all benefit from, from it, and that needs a funding mechanism to recognize that those states that are hosting refugees, Jordan is a good example, they're taking on a responsibility, I would say, rather than a burden, but they do need support in fulfilling that responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Just one more question. I, I, you know, you were mentioning some statistics earlier, and I don't know if you saw this today. It just came out a few hours ago, I think, from the IDMC, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. But their estimate now is 59.1 million IDPs, oh. internally displaced persons, almost 60 million. It is staggering. The numbers yeah, are but staggering. Yeah, that's, that's because there are these, I mean, I really, um, I, was to, I was talking to you, uh, yeah about uh, to the chairman about um, the report we the watch list that we issued in December 2021 I gave a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations which might be of interest was it talked about um, if you like it, it, it went beyond the humanitarian to the geopolitical mm. and it argued that we were the, the, the scale of displacement and humanitarian need, 275 million people in 20 watch list countries in humanitarian need, quarter of the population of those countries, more than a third of the population of those countries, um, reflected what we called system failure. Mm -hmm. You could have said multilateral system failure. And it was system failure at four levels. One, state failure. So not just poor states unable to support their own citizens, but states bombing their own citizens and persecuting their own citizens. Secondly, diplomatic failure, 55 conflicts, eight of them severe with more than 1,000 battlefield deaths, and the tools of diplomacy not being used effectively to resolve those. Legal failure, so this speaks to your profession, legal failure that the rights of civilians in war not to be targeted or killed, the rights of civilians caught up in war to receive humanitarian aid being abrogated in what I call the age of impunity. Because I think the next decade is all about accountability versus impunity. Uh, it's not about democracy versus autocracy, actually. It's about, I think, it's about accountability versus impunity. And then fourthly, humanitarian development failure because the systems that exist in the United Nations, organized by the United Nations, organized by the donors, are not good enough. And the development and humanitarian sectors don't speak to each other properly. 
within those sectors, the agencies don't work together properly. And so there's a lot to do. Yeah, absolutely. One last question, then we're going to invite our panelists up. So this is part of a series focused on the international rule of law, and in particular, thinking about the US's role on the broader global stage. And I'm just wondering if you have any reflections about what more could the US be doing, should the US be doing, is the US doing now? Um, if you have any words of wisdom to share with us yeah. about our own role. Well, I think that you, well, I can't say we, you're not the shining light on the hill at the moment. Um, shining city on the hill, sorry. City, yeah. Um, it's a great country in all sorts of ways, which does great things internationally as well as nationally. But it's obviously blemished at the moment uh, in all sorts of ways. And I think that one indicator of that is kind of interesting and slightly provocative, but um, if you know that vote in the UN Security in the UN General Assembly to condemn the Russian invasion of uh, yeah. Ukraine, it was 141 to five. Uniting for peace, right? But that means that 50 countries abstained, and those 50 countries that abstained represented, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, 60% of the global population. So it is China and India, but it's not just China and India. Lots of countries that are democratic, South Africa, yeah. abstained, India, abstained. Um, and some of the reasons that they abstained are to do with their own military ties to Russia. Some of the reasons they abstained are that they don't want to get caught in the crossfire between the US and China. You can understand that if you're a small country, although Singapore voted to condemn mm -hmm. because of belief in sovereignty and territorial integrity and the rule of law. But a large group of countries abstained because they felt the West was hypocritical in its treatment of refugees. The West was hypocritical in its treatment of violations of international law. And the West was an inc inconstant partner of theirs. Mm. And I think we should take that seriously. And it's not just the US, obviously the UK is blemished as well in various ways. Um, although it wouldn't recognize the phrase building a more perfect union in the, in the same way. And I, I think that um, the US has a really important responsibility in the way it gets its own house in order because when the US doesn't have its own house in order, and its legal house is an important part of that, that gives sucker, it gives power to all sorts of bad actors who want to say, well, if the Americans do X, if the Americans don't give asylum seekers rights to the southern border, if the Americans don't uphold the sanctity of the ballot, well, why should we? And so I think that's a pretty serious, it's obviously a serious issue for you internally. It is, it is. But it's a very serious issue for your leadership internationally, which I think Americans still want. Because Americans do want to lead internationally. And Americans, because of the America, because of its wealth and power, should lead internationally. But it, it can't, it has to lead in part by example. And so there's work, I think, to be done. And, you know, we're, we're a global organization, the IRC, but we're American headquartered. And there are virtues. Of, of that, that I think we like to uphold because the country has great things to say and do and offer. But um, you, you know well, I think, that there's work work to do. And it, the, the, I can't emphasize enough the international reverberations of the national actions. And chaos nationally obviously has international repercussions, but bad example nationally has international implications of a period of pretty serious kind. and. The fact that Europe, any European leader worth their salt at the moment has to hedge against the future of American politics and the future of American international engagement. And that hedging is, um, has consequences. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask our panelists, and if you would join us on the dais, we'll do a quick panel, and then we'll save the Q&A for the end of the evening, if that's okay. And we're meant to leave these here, aren't we? We were told very strongly to leave them.
and get you a bunch of things. Great. Well, thanks so much, David, for setting the stage for us. Um, we have an esteemed panel of experts with us this evening. And so I'm going to jump right into it. I'd like to introduce um, Alex Elenikoff. He's my former dean at Georgetown Law. He is the university professor at New School of Social Research and heads the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility. He's written widely about immigration, refugee law. There's a book called The Arc of Protection, Reforming the International Refugee Regime. And um, he's working on a book now, I think. Uh, sorry, that's the, that's the book you're currently working on, right, Alex? So the Arc of that's, Protection. No, it's in public. Is it? Yeah. Has it been published? A couple of years ago. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, Alex also served for a time as the UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, he was on the Immigration Task Force for President Barack Obama's transition team, served as General Counsel for the Immigration and Naturalization Service, uh, JD from Yale, BA from Swarthmore. So Alex, is it, is it fair for me to say that um, traditionally nation states have avoided, for the most part, international conversations about um, human mobility? And I think, to some extent, I remember my uh, property class at Georgetown where we were taught that um, property is a bundle of rights. So you have the right to bequeath the property and the right to rent the property and to improve it and all those things. But one of the rights is the right to exclude, right? And so if you're a nation and you can't exclude people, it, it doesn't really feel like your own home. So I guess that's one of the reasons that people have avoided this. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Lately, in the last decade or so, there have been more international conversations, more space for this dialogue with the Global um, Forum on Migration and Development. Right now we have the International Migration Review Forum at the UN, the Global Compact and other things. So I'd like to hear you talk to us about this changing dialogue, but maybe you could use Ukraine as a jumping off point. Okay, um, it sounds like Did a, I set you a up party there? game to give someone five words and you know make a story out of them <laughs> somehow, you know, but um, I do want to start with Ukraine, uh, just a couple of thoughts on Ukraine. Um, uh, it, it is easy to point to the disparate treatment that European countries uh, made out for Ukrainians versus Afghans and others who've come from other places. And the press did a pretty good job. And now we have the UK welcoming Ukrainian refugees and then making a deal with Rwanda to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. So, so I mean, th that's pretty clear. But I, I want to say something else about this because I think it points to the failure of the system that David alluded to. So, so the analogy is not really how Europe treated Ukrainians versus Afghans. I think the analogy is how Europe treated Ukrainians and how Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey treated Syrians. So what, what I mean by that is that the one way that the international refugee system works is that people generally can get out of their country and flee next door. So you had six million Syrians, right? You had about six million Ukrainians, and, and you had a million Rohingya who went to Bangladesh. And, and so those borders of neighboring countries are largely left open. So the, so the Ukrainian story is very much like the Syrian story. And the fact that two years after, uh, when the Syrians started to come in 2015 to Europe, and the Europeans said, wait, you've already gotten asylum next door, don't come pretty similar to what the United States might have said if people, if Ukrainians had started coming without invitations to, uh, to the United States. So um, I, I say that because it means the system does work in terms of immediate rescue, but it leads to exactly the problem that, uh, that David identified, is these, these situations are never solved. People can't go home because the conflict's not ended and they're not resettled elsewhere in any great number and they're largely not integrated into their countries and that's, that's really where the system has to work better. So even though we have a convention and an agency, and I'll say just a word and answer about the migration side of this, which we don't in migration. For refugees, we've got UNHCR and we've got a convention. We've actually got international law that most of the states of the world have signed on to. We don't have a global responsibility sharing system. And there was a when the, there were two compacts adopted four years ago in the UN, the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, what is it, I always get it wrong, Safe, Orderly, and Regular Orderly. Migration, well, it's usually called this, uh, the Compact on Migration. 
Um, but, uh, but in neither, and particularly in the refugee compact, was there the creation of an international responsibility sharing system. So we still have people fleeing next door and just staying there. I've called this the second exile, that you know, exiled from their homes, but then exiled from re, uh, restarting um, their lives. One other point about um, Ukraine. There, there is a real development here that I think could be very important. I'd love to hear David's thoughts on this as well, and that's the creation of a private sponsorship system, which Canada's been doing it for a while, uh, and it's been talked about in the U.S., but what I mean by that is usually the way resettlement works is you and HR identify some folks overseas, they meet with relative countries, countries say how many people they'll take, they send them over with IOM's help, and then people are resettled in David's organization with other aid organizations in the United States, then take them once they get here, and then help them go to communities. Under a private sponsorship model, groups of Americans can get together and say, I want to bring this refugee in and can identify the refugee. It's going to often be a family member, but, uh, but someone as well. And the US has made clear that they are willing to open that up in the Ukrainian parole system and the refugee system to bring, let people sponsor them in. And think about that. I mean, I think the goodwill of many Americans would lead to you know, entry of really tens of thousands of more people through a private sponsorship model. And so I think that's very, that's a significant positive thing. The last thing I'll say on Ukraine is, there's a real problem here that the United States has not defined what victory in Ukraine means yet. And I say that because, I'll say something probably pretty unpopular. From my perspective, the war should end immediately on whatever terms are possible, because every day more refugees are being created and every day more people are being killed and harmed. And, and I fear that the press of the West here and the press of military folks in the West and, and po politicians who love a good war are seeking to extend this war for other purposes that are not taking into account the creation of refugees. I mean, refugees are always collateral damage in a way. They're not, you know, so to say, you know, gee, if we can create a million fewer refugees, maybe we ought to think about ending this war pretty quickly is not taken into account. And, and that's kind of, the U.S. has not said what victory is, what, what, what its end goal in Ukraine is. And, uh, and that's a problem, I think. Others may have other views on that. All right, I'll just say a quick, do you, how, how much longer do you want me to talk? Two minutes more? Yeah, a couple of minutes more. Minutes. Okay, um, uh, the Global Compact on Migration I mentioned briefly. So this is the what, what, what Michael referred to here is um, this week at the UN is the IMRF, International Migrant Review Forum, Migration Review Forum, which is a, um, a taking stock of what progress has been made under the Global Compact on Migration. The Global Compact on Migration is an interesting document. It is a... It's, it's people who wrote it four years ago said at the UN that it was an attempt to create a, a, an ecosystem for thinking about migration regulation at the global level. Why? Because unlike the refugee system, there is no international institution that manages uh, international migration. There are some norms, human rights norms and others, but there's no real international law on migration or a structure for uh, for making making that work, and and the GMC, the Global Migration Compact, was was an attempt uh, to start uh, thinking about that. So there's a lot. I won't read you. There were 23 different commitments and the like, but it's not a binding document. Um, it's it's not a convention that creates law. It is rather a set of state commitments. And this we've gotten to a point where we don't really make international law anymore. We simply have like in the Declaration, the New York Declaration. So before that, we just states make you know they'll say, well maybe we'll try to accomplish these kinds of things. And so this forum in the UN that's being held now is an attempt to see have states lived up to their commitments to, you know, be nicer to refugees and respect respect their rights and. and make sure they're included in benefits programs and make transmission of remittances easier and not detain people as much as they're doing and the like. Uh, uh, and so it's this funny place we're in in terms of international law where we have a document that lays out some pretty interesting uh, provisions if they were carried forward and if they were binding law. Um, but they're not and there's no real way to keep states accountable to them. When the United States did not sign the Global Compact on Migration when it was first adopted. It's by the Biden administration is now more favorable towards it. But it was based on the idea that, look, we know what's going to happen. This thing's going to be adopted. People are going to call it soft law, and soft law is going to grow into hard law, and suddenly we'll have all these new commitments that we really haven't um, signed on to. And this goes to the basis of Michael's question, is that, that 
a still in a world that has become so global and such a recognition of international law and international human rights, regulation of migration has been kept very close. It's seen as kind of the last bastion of state sovereignty and something that should be kept a state regulation. Even in the EU, interestingly, there was some doubling we can talk about the kind of stuff, but, but still it was left up to the individual states of the EU uh, to make their own third country migration rules, even if there's free movement within the EU. And this is true uh, around the world. It's viewed as very much a, a state prerogative. So we've, we've advanced, the answer, the short answer, Michael, is we've advanced a little bit with the, with the global compact. There's a, there, are norm, there are norms waiting to, slouching towards Bethlehem, if I can put it that way. Um, but, um, but they have yet to be, um, to be uh, turned into hard international law. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, the last bastion of state sovereignty. I think that's the best way to put it, actually. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce Camille Lacoz, who is a senior policy analyst with the Migration Policy Institute, uh, MPI. I don't know how old it is now, maybe 15 years old, 20, 20, years, years. 20 years old. It's had a meteoric rise to really be, you know, forgive anybody else on the panel here, but really, you know, one of the world's premier uh, think tanks for migration policy. So I'm really thrilled to have Camille with us here today. Um, she was based in Kenya for a while in Afghanistan. She's done a lot of research on trafficking. Um, her specialty is in EU migration issues, migration and development. So I'm hoping that Camille today can bring to us a bit of a European perspective on what's happening especially with Ukraine. And I'm also interested to hear not only about Ukraine, but um, more importantly, to the point of this panel, the role of the United States. And um, have we been a better partner in recent years, or is there more that we could be doing? So thanks. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you to the New York City Bar Association for hosting us. Um, yeah, so I think here, and I mean, David and I are both European, but I'll be the French European in the panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'd like to share some reflection on, you know, the European response to, to the war in Ukraine, um, what this means also for the future of European migration and asylum policies. And finally, what this means also for a partnership with, with the US, uh, which has been quite yeah, silent in, during the Trump administration, but is now, I would say, resuming. So first on the response uh, to the Ukraine crisis. I think um, for us in Brussels, the activation of um, this mechanism that uh, David referred to, it's called the Temporary Protection Directive, was a bit of a divine surprise. Like we never expected that the European could suddenly activate this, this weird text that had never been activated before. Um, and the reason for that is since 2015, 16 and the crisis when 1.3 million people arrive in Europe. There's been a lot of division uh, on this topic of migration and asylum. It's a case in the U.S., but in a way, what's what's yeah, what's symptomatic? I mean, what's difficult in Europe is countries have to agree between each other, and migration is one topic where all of them have to agree. And countries on the Eastern Bloc, especially Hungary and Poland, have really done a blockade on on this question of migration and contested anything related to you know, the positive aspect of migration in the past years. And we've referred to the global compact. Hungary has really opposed uh, this, this international agreement, whereas really this was very much aligned with everything that the EU had been doing uh, in, in many ways for years. Um, but it, it's, it's not just been the Eastern Bloc, it's also been north of Europe against south of Europe. As a French, I've seen the French fighting with, with Italian, and, and really this question of like, who is gonna have responsibility over people arriving to Europe from Northern Africa, from you know, other parts in Africa, but also from, from the Middle East and Afghanistan and further away. Um, so this division explained why this mechanism was, was never activated. And whereas when it was created in 201, this was after the war in the Balkan, and the idea was like, next time there is a war, European states are gonna have something they can use if there is a mass arrival of refugees in Europe. So that asylum system don't need to be won't, won't be overwhelmed, we won't have to go through that process, which is an individual asylum process. So each person has to go through this process individually. It takes a lot of time. And when you have a million refugee, uh, this is obviously not ideal because people have to wait, and it means they have to wait um, to, get a, a, to get a status to start their life again. 
Um, so this was never activated in 2011 when there was a wrap spring. This was obviously not activated in 2015, 16. And also last summer when um, Kabul fell to the Taliban regime, there was discussion at some point as to whether this could be activated. And of course, Europeans say, no, there is no way this, this could work. So in a way, this had been, this had been forgotten. And so when, you know, a few weeks, just two weeks after the war in Ukraine started, a European state agreed that, yes, they were going to activate it, which means all Ukrainian were going to get um, immediately status, right to education, right to education, sorry, to health, social protection, shelter. Um, this was, um, yeah, this was a big deal. And for us talking to policymakers, you know, at the European Commission, in different EU member states, this is something they were surprised about, that countries could agree, even Hungary, Poland, and you know, on a topic that has been so acrimonious in, in the past years. But also, they were very proud. Like, this is something they say, well, you know, in the, in the past year, it's been so difficult to work on this topic, but at least we've done that. Like, this is something we've, we've achieved. Now, they're really forming factor, I think, that explain why, why. This is different this time. Um, well, this is a refugee crisis in Europe. And it's been a useful reminder that these crises are not just all far away, um, but they also happen on European soil, which, you know, you would think given our history, we would, we would remember. Um, second, this has been an aggression by Russia. And this is really critical to understand the response of a country like Poland that, again, over the years has been very, um, yeah, very, against hosting refugees. Um, I would say there is a third reason, which is, and it's, a, yeah, it's honestly, there was no other way around because if Europe had not done that, our national asylum system would have probably collapsed because we could not have processed so many refugee in such a short amount of time. Um, and finally, I think as, as we mentioned earlier, for some European countries, for some European government, for some segment of the European uh, population, there is, of course, this, this perception that Ukrainian are better refugees because they're European, they're white, they're Christian. And so, um, yeah, they have benefited from, I think, this image that other refugee groups have not enjoyed, including the Afghan who's been fleeing the Taliban regime uh, most, most recently. Now, this temporary protection regime, it's really only the beginning because, as I mentioned, this was never activated. So all the country had to come up with a system on how this was gonna work out. And what advantage that we had in Europe is we recently set up this European Union asylum agency. It really has grown since 2015, 2016, and this is a bit of the operational body um, and has been really instrumental in supporting EU member states in, in setting up this system. There are also many open questions on integration, how we're gonna integrate all these people in the long term. Sorry, in the long term. And then there's still this question. This is a temporary status. So sure, in theory, it can be renewed up to three years, but member states are going to have to agree to that. And so now we have all this political momentum and it's wonderful, but already next year, what if some country decide that they're tired of this crisis, they're tired of these refugees? And I think this is a key question for European policymakers today is how do we keep the momentum that this, um, this support continues, um, and I'll, I'll get back to that. So that's further response to what has happened in, in Europe with this Ukraine crisis. Um, but, but I think as we've discussed, there's been the Ukraine crisis and really the focus on uh, what has happened with the Ukrainian, but this is in the context of a much broader conversation on the future of European asylum and migration policies in the continent. Um, and as I said, a lot of fight over, over the years. Um, I do think there is hope on, on three fronts. Um, one is European countries have come together. Uh, this was unexpected. And also the European Commission, which is the government body of the EU, has really been proactive. Um, the European Commission has sometimes been hiding between, behind member states and explained that member state and Hungary were blocking things so they could not really do much. But on this crisis, they've really been proactive, I think, looking for mechanisms to try to, uh, to help refugees. And so I think this is a major improvement compared to 2015, 16. There have been a lot of learning also on, on, on what could be done. Um, there may be related to that some timid progress on what's called the Pact on Migration Asylum, which is this big document that the Commission put together and presented. Um, there's 
been a lot of division, um, but now there's been an agreement that maybe step by step countries could come to you know, a consensus on what could be done. And this is important because so far, negotiation have been blocked on asylum, which is a problem, but also on other topic uh, like legal migration, which is essential, but is also very like really not popular at the moment in, in Europe. The second point is um, the learning on, on integration. I think on this, on this front, a lot has been done since 2015-16. Um, my colleagues at MPI have worked a lot on social innovation um, and how this has really helped refugees in Europe. But we've also seen the role of, of other actors, such as civil society organization and municipalities. And this is something that, that's actually quite new for Europe because Seven years ago, many cities did not have anyone working in migration in the city, in the municipality services, whereas now you have people who know about migration, know about refugees, and they're actually in contact with, like, there are now networks of European cities that work together on how they can learn, on how to host refugees. And I think this is really something to build on, and, and that's quite, quite promising. And finally, there's a point I like to refer to, and I think it's also talking to a lot of these people on a regular basis, which is all the personal relationships that have been developed over the years. Um, seven years ago, many people who worked in development, home of birth, they didn't even know each other. Like, they didn't talk to each other, they didn't know who their counterpart was, sometime within the European Commission, sometime within their own government. And I think now, even if of course, somebody from the Ministry of Interior is going to hold quite a different view from the person from the Ministry of Development. They're still going to know who is who, and they're going to be able to talk to each other, to coordinate. And I think this has been, um, this has been another major progress. But <laughs> there are three warning signs. Um, one, and, and we refer to it, public support can fade very quickly. Um, because we know that integration, it's not straightforward. Um, we know that you know, this simplistic narrative of the good, deserving refugee really does not match the reality. And so we, I, European government really need to be careful about, main, you know, keeping control over the narrative. And sometimes government tend to just ignore and do not want to talk about refugees because they know this is, uh, this, you know, this is a divisive topic. So I think there is a work to be done on, on what narrative this government can share. Second, there is a risk on, on the cost of all of this response. So, you know, economists have shown in the long term refugee, you know, benefit to your community, or at least this is like a no cost situation. It depends. But in the short term, it is a cost for society at the moment in terms of investing in shelters, in access to economic services, public services. Um, and this is happening at a time where European economies are recovering from COVID and are facing a number of difficulties. So there is a risk that Europe turned even more inward at a time where, with the Ukraine crisis, um, the situation in Europe is not getting better. And we've talked about the other crises around the world. We've talked about Lebanon. Lebanon is hosting 1.5 million Syrian refugees. They're also hosting Palestinian refugees. Uh, they're going through a major crisis. And so they need support from the outside. But we're having these discussions in some European capital as to whether they should not keep the money, you know, the development money, the humanitarian money for the response to the Ukraine crisis because they're all, you know, resources are scarce. And so, um, yeah, unfortunately, some of this conversation are happening and I think they, they're quite worrisome. So I'll just, um, I'll just finish with, with maybe three points, some final thought on the partnership between Europe and the, the US and three opportunities. And, and Alex has already um, mentioned one that, that I think is interesting is, is the resettlement and complementary pathways conversation. So as we mentioned, resettlement and complementary pathways are a way for refugee to come you know, from a country of first asylum to a third country, either the US or Europe. Um, during the Trump administration, resettlement almost stopped uh, in the US. Um, whereas in Europe, this has been a time where really more EU member states have started their own program um, they've also set up complementary pathway programs. So this is, for instance, humanitarian corridors. Um, so it, it's all sorts of ways through which refugee can come to Europe. But now there is a risk that with so many refugees already from Ukraine in Europe, there is less political appetite for European to host refugees. 
And so I think it's a good time for the U.S. to kind of pick up the button and, and keep this momentum on um, resettlement and complementary pathways, especially now with, with this new scheme being set up in the U.S., where I think there are opportunities uh, to show that U.S. and EU can, can work together on this. So that's one, uh, that's one uh, opportunity. The other one is on this very sensitive topic that was discussed this week at the IMRF, so this International Migration Review Forum of this Global Compact on Migration, which is the topic of return. Um, on return, Europeans have made progress in terms of advocating voluntary return and reintegration. This means that for people who do not have legal status and are go back to their country of origin, there is support for them to go back. And for a long time, the idea is this support was just going to be made for them not to never come, you know, to never migrate again. And I think this week, we've seen the conversation shifting among some European countries who are not talking about the fact that reintegration assistance should be connected to development cooperation and that for people who return to their country, sustainable reintegration does not mean they never migrate again. It means maybe they'll have access to migration again to Europe or you know, through the region where, where they're returning to. Um, so that's, that was maybe, a, that was the second area of, um, yeah, where I see an opportunity. And, and the third one is on development assistance, because um, yes, uh, the, the US is now spending a lot of money in Central America to address the root causes of migration. Europe has done the same in Africa. So, you know, European and American government keep spending money to stop migration by spending development money. Um, research shows that it does not work. Research also shows that it can really have a negative effect because it leads you to, you know, work with regime that may be unsavory, um, also not pay sufficient attention to governance, which in the end, you know, does not benefit the development of these countries. And so I think this um, a lot, you know, can be learned on both sides on what can be done better um, on development assistance, and this include development assistance to refugee situation, and IRC has been working on that, um, how to have another approach uh, to respond to the crisis in the Middle East, but also in the Orne and elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. I'm glad you mentioned the Temporary Protection Directive. Years ago, I wrote a paper and did some analysis on it, and my legal analysis proved that there was not a snowball's chance in hell that it would ever be used, but um, I'm glad that I was wrong. Um, I want to turn quickly to Eleanor Acer. I had promised David we would try and get him out of here by 7.30 or so. Um, Eleanor is the senior director, and I want to have some time for some quick questions. So Eleanor is the senior director of refugee protection at Human Rights First. Um, Human Rights First used to be called the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, but some years ago they rebranded yeah. themselves. And they're very much focused on the beltway and on the role and responsibility of the U.S. when it comes to issues like refugee protection, asylum, and migrants' rights that are um, Eleanor's um, um, basket of expertise. So if I could turn it over to you, if you would please give us a perspective from inside the Beltway. Okay, um, so my name is Eleanor Acer. Very nice to meet you all. I'm gonna try to be super quick so we can accommodate David's schedule and then you all can ask me lots of questions during the, the Q&A. Um, so Human Rights First is a US-based human rights organization. We spend, as a result, a lot of our time advocating with the US government to uphold uh, its international human rights and refugee protection obligations, including the Refugee Convention and its protocol, which our co-panelists here mentioned earlier. Um, the United States should be leading and leading by example. Um, and that means upholding here at home the rules that we look to other countries to adhere to and uphold all the time, right? U.S. State Department officials, U.S. presidents even sometimes, go and visit other countries and say, you know, leave your borders open so that people can flee. Please, you know, please make sure to, to not turn people back to, to places where their lives are in danger. But here at home, the United States is not following, um, not following even its own refugee law right now. And, um, turning refugees away to places uh, where their lives are very much at risk. Um, this is a result of a sort of combination of policies that um, developed over the last administration. Um, one policy was called metering, a second was called remain in Mexico, and the third one was a public health policy. Um, essentially, these are a series of policies that turn people back um, 
to places in Mexico that are highly dangerous, uh, where they're targeted for kidnappings and at brutal attacks. Um, in some cases, people are sent back to their home country. The policy that's currently in place that you may have heard about is referred to as quote unquote Title 42. Basically, um, th this was not something that the CDC itself decided to do, it was something that um, a, um, an advisor to former President Trump named Stephen Miller. Some of you may have heard of Stephen Miller. <laughs> okay, some of you have, yes. Um, he had long wanted to use public health policy to turn away migrants and asylum seekers. And so when COVID came, uh, one of the first things uh, that the CDC was very much pressured to do over the objections of senior scientists was to issue an order giving authority to turn people away um, at the border. And that meant turning away people who were, were migrants, were trying to you know, cross the border to come here and work, who would have otherwise be, been sent back quickly under policies known as expedited removal or removal processes, basically under the enforcement of our immigration laws. Instead, they just were turned away under this public health policy. But for people seeking refuge, it meant uh, that they were not allowed to seek asylum, despite the fact that we're a party to the refugee protocol, despite the fact that we actually have laws and refugee laws that give people a right to have a process, right, to establish whether or not they've got a well-founded fear of persecution or not. So at the, our border right now, um, you know, you have this horrible, horrific situation where you have people who are struggling to survive, living in very dangerous circumstances. One of the things Human Rights First does is document the number of attacks reported on these people, the number of brutal, brutal kidnappings. And many of these people, of course, have family in the U.S. And so their family are called, um, you know, and, and, and uh, asked to pay ransom. It's, it's a horrible situation. So I'm giving you all this background so you understand how I and, and others you know, reacted in part, and more importantly, how refugees from other countries reacted in part, seeing, seeing the very right, right and warm welcome um, extended across the world to Ukrainian refugees. So um, you know, we all watched on television, right, day in and day out, the kind of welcome um, that is extended to, has been extended to Ukrainian refugees, and rightly, as I said, right? Um, communities welcoming people. Suddenly people understood why someone would need to cross multiple borders, not even just you know, cross one border, but multiple borders to, to get to somewhere where they've got family that they could stay with. Something that is you know, questioned again and again and again when you're dealing with other refugee populations. The news media, I, I was very glad that you, you talked about the, the use of words like flood, tsunami. I mean, you know, I, I have spent a lot of my time <laughs> over the last couple of years constantly calling out reporters using words like tsunami, flood, surge, all of these dehumanizing terms to refer to people who are you know, literally fleeing for their lives. Um, you saw that language used sparingly. I did see it sometimes, but sparingly when it came to Ukrainian refugees. Um, the United States you know, extent, you know, was, was clear right, that it would, it would um, step up and help uh, the countries neighboring, uh, neighboring Ukraine and, and take in some refugees. Um, many Ukrainians, though, in the me meantime, started heading to the US southern border. So I've described to you very briefly the situation that faced refugees from all these different countries. They're, they're stranded, they're not allowed to cross. Lawyers are desperately trying to you know, convince some official to let you know, a, a really at-risk person you know, cross the border. Um, and it's not happening. All of a sudden, many Ukrainian refugees came and it was a very different welcome. You know, a really nice welcome center was set up in Mexico. And of course, Ukrainian Americans, family members came to the border, right, to, to try to make sure that their family could get across. Um, all the kinds of things that you know you would you would sometimes see with other refugee populations, but all of a sudden, kind of it was understood. Um, Ukrainian refugees were extended an exemption from that Title 42 policy. So you actually had this situation, and one of our researchers was there observing this. You have this situation where there's a line of Ukrainian refugees who are getting in, one after another after another, right? Refugees from other countries, 
are turned away, are not allowed in. Uh, maybe there's a few who are being given the very, very rare exemptions, but they're sitting there and waiting and waiting. And the refugees themselves are actually talking to each other. Um, you know, the Ukrainian refugees were talking with the Haitian refugees and the Hondurans, and some of them afterwards are saying, gee, you know, so it's not fair. Like, everyone should be, be able to, to, to seek asylum. These other people should be able to get in, too. So anyway, that's a um, long story um, just to show a little bit of the sort of the disparate, the disparate treatment. Um, but I will say there are some positive lessons learned, and I'll be quick because I know we're, we're short on time. Um, you know, the, what the United States was actually able to do after, after saying over and over again it didn't have the capacity to actually process refugees at the border, they didn't have the capacity, didn't have the capacity, well, they were able to process, I think, about 10,000 Ukrainians at the border really pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and so there are, you know, they use some processes, they use some, some new strategies, um, you know, that um, they... They, they curtailed, they made some processes more streamlined, right? And, and there were differences, but, they, but there are a lot of th lessons learned out of that for how we can more quickly process people seeking asylum at the, at the border. And part of the reason they were able to get Ukrainians through is that they have been thinking about like how to do things uh, much better at the border instead of like throwing people who show up to ports of entry and want to seek asylum like into these hard conditions, like maybe there's a way to do it quicker. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the idea of, um, you know, sponsorship, right? And people watching on TV saw how communities across the country extended welcome to Ukrainian refugees, right? That same kind of welcome, sponsorship, um, and support from communities should absolutely apply to people seeking asylum. Many of the asylum seekers who come here, as I mentioned, you know, have families, whether they're, you know, whether they're coming from Venezuela or Cuba or Honduras or El Salvador, many from Haiti, most of the time when you talk to people, they've decided to come here when they've left because they've got some family or friends here, like anyone would do. Like people understand, of course, the Ukrainians who left want to be somewhere where they have family and friends who can help them, hopefully during this short period where they're displaced. But you know, as we often see, um, displacement periods are a lot longer than uh, than we anticipate. So I think I'll stop there, even though I've got a lot of other uh, suggestions and ideas, but in the interest of time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you so much. Let's try and do a couple quick questions. If anybody has questions, maybe Clay, if you wouldn't mind to, to help us. We have the microphones, but um, rather than have you come up, maybe we'll just um, bring the microphone to you if anybody has any quick thoughts. Um, just here in the fourth row back. Hello, and thank you so much for the conversation today. I think I'll break the ice by asking the first question. So I think we've heard a lot about the failure of the multilateral system today. And I think we're also touched upon how we're seeing an increase in bilateral aid and in these bilateral relations and national policies. So in this respect, I would like to point to two things. Number one, the International Development Strategy released by the UK yesterday that also talks about this increase in bilateral aid and shift away from the multilateral um, organizations as being ineffective. And number two, countries like Sweden and Norway, <clears throat> sorry, <Whew. laughs> announcing that they will be reprogramming funding, usually used for ODA towards covering refugee costs at home. The question that I have in this respect, it's quite easy to talk about what are the disadvantages of us going back to this domestic oriented level of cooperation, but are there any positive sides that we can take away from this? I hope I was clear and let me know if I should clarify further. Um, I'm afraid I haven't read the new UK international development strategy okay. published uh, yesterday, so I can't uh, comment on that. Look, I think that the the international system, let's call it that rather than just the multilateral system, is multiply challenged at the moment. And COVID, which should have been a relatively straightforward case for international cooperation, because the risks of disparate activity were so obvious, 
has actually become a rather chilling poster child for the f lack of international cooperation. And people still talking about a post-COVID era, but we're of course in an era where the mutation of the disease is much more likely than the eradication of the disease. And so we're, we're waiting to see is the next variant going to be more transmissible, more virulent, et cetera. Um, I think you were also hinting that we should be in the solutions business, not just in the, um, not just in the suffering business, if you like. And I think there is quite a lot coming out of this crisis that is very striking. One, I don't want to harp on about it, but the degree of unity in Europe has been very, very striking. And um, I think that it's sent a very strong signal to other um, regional organizations. For example, the African Union, which has got a very strong, the equivalent of the CDC, the African CDC in health, um, I think you can see them looking at the ways in which the EU has cooperated and taking some inspiration from that. So I think that's one thing that's important. Secondly, I do think that this law of, or rules versus impunity framing is very strong. I really commend to you the comments that were made by the Sing Singaporean Prime Minister when he was here last month. Um, because I think there is a very large constituency that is very concerned that the alternative to rules is anarchy and that that's dangerous. Um, third, thirdly, um, there have been, I think both um, Alex and Camille referred to this, uh, the examples of civil society, of municipal action um, across Europe have been very striking. And actually the US as well, rising to this private sponsorship model. My own view is that it's a good thing, but you also need the professionals. And the best is where the private sponsorship is supported by the um, by professional agencies because often these cases turn out to be very complicated and when people in Berlin say to you no it was good to invite someone for two days and good for them two weeks and good for two months but oh my god it might be two years living in my uh, spare room it takes some organization and some professional support but I think the innovation that's been around this has been very striking and very positive as well Great. Uh, just here in the front row Clay thanks There is uh, one country uh, that I have not heard mentioned in this discussion, and that country is Russia. I think it likely, and I don't think I'm alone in this, uh, that a great many people will try to leave Russia, take this as an opportunity to leave Russia. I also think unavoidably and justifiably so, that uh, the European community, the Americans, and uh, many other organizations as well, uh, consider justifiably so Russia responsible for some sort of, for lack of a better word, I would call reparations for having created this whole system situation in the first place. So what are we gonna do about them? I think that, uh, Alex, I don't know if you've seen the figure, or Camille, or I don't know if you've seen the figure, but I, I, the figure I saw is that 300,000 Russians have left the country. Um, yeah. Uh, generally, I don't remember the, the number, but like journalists, and you know, it started with journalists and, and political activists and the people who are participating in those protests. Yeah. Many uh, others. Uh, there are two million Russians who live in Germany, I was told, of Russian origin. But there are three 300,000 um, Russians. I mean, my own strong prediction is they will get a pretty warm welcome in Western countries, which of course may exacerbate some of the... Oh. They've also yeah. showed up at the southern border. <laughs> There's a tradition... Is that the southern border? <laughs> yeah. There's a tradition of Russian refugees. I mean, the, the international refugee system was created really after World War I with the collapse of the Russian Empire and the, the Office of High Commissioner for Refugees was really the High Commissioner for Russian refugees when it was first started. And then, of course, in the Cold War era, anyone fleeing from the, you know, the Eastern Bloc was welcomed into the West for resettlement purposes. These were very different times. I just, as, a, as a, David told a personal story, I'll tell one personal story. The Elenikovs fled Kiev when it was part of the Russian Empire in 1880. Uh, after the uh, pogroms, uh, but the following of the assassination of the czar. So they were 
They were refugees from Russia, from Ukraine at the time, but of course it was Russia. And uh, my great great grandfather became a lawyer in New York, as did his son and his son and his son. So I'm the fourth generation member of the New York City bar uh, <laughs> for that family, which like your story, they, they fled Russia and they ended up as New York. We couldn't get out of New York, couldn't get out of the Lower East Side, I guess. Anyway, um, but um, I, think the, I think the Russians will continue to be welcomed in New York and elsewhere. But not at the southern border. <laughs> Listen, if I can, I'd like to close us out a bit uh, early at 7.30 uh, to accommodate David. I'm also conscious of the fact that we do have a reception across the halls, and I've, I've learned uh, in my years at City Bar never to stand between a lawyer and his liquor. So I don't want to keep you waiting too much longer. I think what we'll do very quickly is ask David if he has any closing remarks. I want to make one quick comment, and then I'm going to turn it over to Steve to ring the bell. Do you have anything you'd like well, to just, part with, um, David? Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the really great contributions from all of the other uh, panelists uh, who, who've really uh, brought tremendous expertise um, to, to balance my practical work. I mean, the thing I would say, or the thing I would ask, is that all of the lawyers in the room think how they can be part of the solution. Uh, because I think that the striking thing about civilians caught up in war, the striking thing about refugees and asylum seekers is that they do have legal rights. The question is whether or not those rights are, whether they're able to exercise them. Uh, I mentioned in passing that we're, ex we're building up our legal services at the southern border or in our offices in uh, southern states. Um, and that's one way in which we um, can work on this. But there's a, this global question of the accountability of power and the uh, promotion and um, maintenance of legal norms um, does underpin not just the whole system of rights for refugees and asylum seekers, but actually it underpins the, the origins of the situations from which they're fleeing in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, I completely understand why President Biden talks about democracy versus autocracy as, the, uh, uh, as an issue of the age for the United States. Um, there's been 16 years of democratic, quote unquote, recession around the world documented by Freedom House. But I do think the wider frame is that we're living at a time when checks on the abuse of power are in retreat. That includes legal checks, but it's not confined to uh, legal checks. But the legal questions are important for internally displaced people in Iraq. They're important for people in Uganda, gay and lesbians in Uganda. They're evident in a wide range of uh, places and it would be nice to think that out of this the interest in tonight's event uh, there was some collaboration cooperation uh, effort our own new york and new jersey resettlement offices uh, work to ensure that the legal rights of those refugees who do arrive legal rights to a green card after one year citizenship after five years are followed through and that may provide uh, some fruitful um, forums for cooperation and action because in the end it's talking about it's one thing doing it is what really counts that would be great thank, thank you. you so much i'm just going to say one quick word and then turn it over to steve to, to to close us out but um it's just an observation we've we've all watched so many throughout our lives uh interviews on television or heard them on the radio and inevitably at the end of the interview the interviewer always says well thank you for being here, and the interviewee always says, well, thank you for having me. I've never heard David say that. It's a pretty remarkable thing. He's the only person in the world, I have to say, who at the end of an interview says, thank you for your interest in this story. And I want to thank you, David, for being such a great storyteller and such a great spokesperson for this cause, and just simply to say to our audience members here this evening, Thank you for your interest in this story. <laughs> Steve, will you close us out? Yeah. Well, I want to thank uh, <clears throat> Michael for moderating uh, this and organizing this program. And David and Alex and Camille and Eleanor, thank you for your incisive remarks. I do want, David, before closing, to um, <clears throat> go hark back to your comment about accountability begins at home and the terrible lesson we have shown. Um, and I mention it because next 
week on May 25th, those of you who are here today should know that the association is having a program called Accountability for January 6th. And I invite you all, it's on, it's on Zoom, it's remote. It's remote, but it is here and personal. Um, so please go to the New York City Bar Association website, nycbar.org, and register for the session on May 25th, at which Barbara McQuaid and others will be speaking about potential criminal or civil remedies or remedies under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment for those who participated in the January 6th insurrection. That is an attempt to follow up specifically on David Miliband's suggestion. Um, thank you all again very much for coming. Uh, don't be strangers here. Welcome the stranger. We welcome the stranger here at the association. And thank you very much. And now it's time to go to the reception and have a drink. Thank you.